Hi there everybody, welcome back to Low Friction Friday. At least I will hope this comes out on a Friday, um, unlike the last few weeks attempts where uh, yeah, initially computer issues resolved with a new computer and then uh, the software decided to have a go last week, which I will hope has been resolved today um, after uh, yeah, sorting last week by repurchasing the same software again and uninstalling and reinstalling and all the fun that that entailed. Fingers crossed, here we go. All right, today's um, yeah, main theme will be the detail review for Silka's Hot Wax X, which I think is likely to be the most expensive immersive wax product on the market. And does that product really, I guess, live up to uh, its very expensive price tag? Uh, now, apologies if there's some background noise. We've got my sort of head groundsman in uh, today doing some uh, work on the lawns in the yard. Uh, now that I've got a desktop, it is rather more difficult to try to move things down into this very sort of soundproofed underground cinema. Uh, I need to get my old uh, Alienware laptop fixed so that I can do that when I need to, <clears throat> but I haven't got that done for today. But see how we go. Hopefully there's not too much noise of whippersnippers and lawn miles, but if you can pick up a bit in the background, apologies for that. Right, quick low friction news section for today, uh, just because it's fairly topical. Uh, I'm still getting through a uh, relatively, I guess, common request to test, you know, X plant-based or eco-based lubricant from, you know, X manufacturer. So it's become quite, I guess, uh, you know, an industry trend now for um, manufacturers to market a eco-based or plant-based uh, chain lubricant, either existing manufacturers or they might be uh, new ones sort of jumping on that bandwagon to use as a platform to step into the market and they're all going to have similar um, spills about obviously how eco-friendly their particular lubricant is and that that you know is going to be better for you uh, and for the environment with regards to using those versus other possibly petroleum based or other based uh, lubricants right, so already there's you know probably around about i'm gonna guess 100 to 200 um sort of eco-friendly uh plant-based uh bicycle chain lubricant products on the market and uh you know when i get requested to have a look at x or can i test a particular one I, i'll have a look at that uh, company their website uh, what they're claiming on the website uh, a lot of them will have a youtube uh, video or two with regards to their products and honestly, they're all basically the same, uh, you know, broadly. Um, so the main thrust is that they are claiming that A, it's a great lubricant, and B, that it is eco-friendly and plant-based. So, you know, there's nothing, unfortunately, that's really, I guess, standing them out with regards to absolutely zero friction cycling should devote the sort of large time and resources to do the, the rather exhaustive zero friction cycling test to see if that product is actually great. Average, not great. You know, due to the, you know, the time and resources involved in the ZFC test, um, I can't just sort of randomly pick one out of say 200 and just hope that that's a great product because it could be anything. So really we need a little bit more from the manufacturers and uh, so I had touched on this in a, in a previous video, but if you're curious with regards to a, um, a product and, and to whether or not it is you know, a great product that we should have a look at, step one really, if you can, will be for you to email that manufacturer and just ask them for more detail. What have they got to substantiate that this product is actually a great product? Because for them to go to market with what they have on their website you know, and on YouTube and so on, I mean, obviously, if they've gone to market with some product claims, they should have done a whole bunch of stuff so that they know that those claims hold up. So what testing have they done to substantiate that their product is actually a great product? Can they share that testing with you? Can they share the data with you? You know, it, it can't just be, we got this, it sounds like that should be good. Uh, we've thrown it in a bottle. It feels like a lubricant when we ride it, and we reckon uh, it's better than other lubricants from, you know, what we feel when we ride it. You know, that is just fluff nothingness. There really should be something tangible that they have to substantiate the product and their marketing claims for the product. If the manufacturer responds to you with something good that's not just fluff, then please let me know, and I'll be, you know, really more than happy to have a deeper look at that product. 
Now, just on the on the topic though, I guess just just a key point to try to make with regards to eco-friendly claims because it's just something to think about um, because it's it really can be just a a bandwagon that companies jump on to obviously try and drive sales. Now, some will be genuine and some will be not, but just be aware of you know examples like this. I'll switch to a completely different product example. It's just another one I saw recently. All right, so yeah, completely different product category just for fun because I'll link it back. Um, here's a great channel, Rose Anvil, that uh, they look into all sorts of uh, boots and shoes and they cut them in half and he's a leather expert and sort of all-around shoe boot expert and looks into claims in, in you know the work boot, dress boot, any type of shoe uh, category. It's pretty uh, sort of fun if you're looking at uh, any sort of new boots or shoes. So um, yeah, so Patagonia, which often tout their sort of um, environmental credentials, uh, they've got a, uh, a boot which is supposed to be more eco-friendly. Uh, it's in the $429, that's US dollar uh, boot category, so a pretty expensive sort of category. Uh, it is, I can't remember now where they get the leather from that's sort of giving them their eco-credentials for the boot, but the main thrust of this, and you can watch this one uh, if you're interested, uh, is that the, you know, the overall quality, uh, he would sort of expect that this boot would maybe last around half the lifespan of other boots, you know, the, the highest quality boots at that price range. So, you know, one can question, I guess, the eco credentials and claims of a product if by its nature it's only going to last, uh, you know, potentially half as long as another product in that category that's just going to keep on ticking. Okay, so yeah, just want to link that back to um, it's the same sort of theory with regards to any eco-friendly lubricant claims. You know, and whilst you know we don't want obviously uh, to discount that, we don't want people running some of the the older generation stuff where the carriers are pretty volatile solvents and environmental hand grenades. There are still some of that out there. A lot of the top products these days have moved well away from that. And whilst they might not be plant based they might be petroleum based they're not having that terrible carrier stuff uh, in there but what you want to factor really is that you know if this eco-friendly product if it's even if it was only performing sort of middle of the road compared to the top uh, drip lubricant products that we found um, that would very easily be at least sort of two to three times the wear rate um, as compared to those those top tested products is it eco-friendly if you are using or sort of wearing through your chain and cassette and chain rings at two to three times the rate as opposed to a you know top performing uh, lubricant that might be petroleum based so it's just something to sort of weigh up because obviously it takes resources to you know manufacture a chain and especially cassettes and chain rings um, and if you need to get the, those two, two to three times as often aside from the cost to you I think it's a hard case to make that that is uh, environmentally better than a top performing product that greatly extends the lifespan of those components. Okay, so when I can get a bit um, sort of, I guess, a free test, test spot, uh, I will try to get um, one or two of the perhaps more higher profile, sort of eco friendly plant based um, lubricants tested, but I would prefer um, rather than just be completely random that um, there is something to substantiate that they've got a, a good chance of being all that and a bag of chips like we found with uh, Effetto's Flower Power um, because there are you know a lot of manufacturers that have either jumped in or diversified into um, making a eco plant-based uh, lubricant it's obviously on trend to uh, to do so some will be doing that very genuinely some will be throwing out just whatever is legitimately can claim as eco and plant-based and have zero absolutely zero knowledge as to whether or not this lubricant is anything other than it's kind of a lubricant um, they'll have no understanding at all because they will have not done any objective testing um, with regards to its actual performance versus good lubricant products in this space so just be aware of that please write to them first ask for them ask them some questions and then yeah loop me in um, if you actually get a decent response okay so yeah it's been a little bit since um silky hit the market with their new hot wax x with nanine so nanine is a very expensive 
uh, additive in the kind of graphene type category. Uh, it's basically like a guarantee as to how many, uh, I think, sort of layers of atoms thick that it is that it's, I think it's going to be under 10 uh, atom layers thick, which starts to get into the very expensive category of, uh, in your sort of graphene area, really above 10 layers thick, I think is typically classed as graphite, which the price tends to come down. There's, a, I believe, a bit of an exponential sort of price increase as you try to get to the lesser and lesser layers of atoms. And the, something like nanine is genuinely very, very expensive. So it's a very expensive additive uh, to put into one's wax. And uh, however, it is supposed to do some uh, awesome things with regards to low friction and also the longevity of the wax treatment. Um, however, at uh, I believe um, last check, the Hot Wax X is around about sort of $280 Australian for a 300 gram tin. So compared to say Molten Speed Wax at uh, 5990 for 520 grams, it's around about 10 times the price. Now, law of diminishing returns with just about everything. Obviously, it's you know one isn't going to expect it to be 10 times as good as in all you know any of the top other wax products on the market like Molten Speed Wax or Silkers Hot Melt or Rex Black Diamond and so on. Um, but like a lot of things, sometimes you have to pay a lot more to get that little bit extra um, sort of kick in performance. So how did it test? Did it do that? Um, and what are the pros and cons? Because there are a few with uh, this particular product that are worth um, sort of knowing about. I touched on them uh, previously in some sort of update vids, but I'll be able to sort of really drive them home today as we get into the detail review. So first up, let's go and have a look at the data. Okay, going to block one, um, so things have started rather super for Hot Wax X. It recorded 0% wear, um, so that's super. Uh, against the average of the, I guess, the top commercial waxes, so this 0.1% uh, result here does not include the candle wax test. And I've also at this time excluded Absolute Black's Graphen Wax, which is terrible, uh, because we've really only tested a handful of products um, with regards to top immersive waxes. It just throws the whole... Uh, thing out with that one really bad result so it, it is excluding those two this is really just versus the top commercial waxes so all of the top commercial waxes that we tested so far you know they're really just smashing that first contamination free uh, test block um, the, all the chain parts are basically coated uh, in a solid coating of super slippery wax leaving the chain metal out of it things just pretty much just do not wear so it's kind of as we would expect. Um, median uh, result for the drip wax lubricants at 5.4%. So that's uh, very strong. And the median for wet lubricants tested to date is 11.1%. Moving to block two, the dry contamination. Uh, it's a fairly similar story overall. We can actually see, yeah, I, I mean, I guess again, hot wax X. So you know, really no uh, contamination penetrated. So it's still at 0%. Uh, the top commercial waxes tested, we're still at you know a very similar result. It's only sort of just above the zero percent, so it's a similar story there. And the the median for the drip wax lubricants has actually dropped down a little bit versus block one. <clears throat> the reason for that is there can be some level of penetration issue for drip lubricant waxes, but they're very high dust contamination resistance has meant that really the you know the top ones have not struggled in this block two either so that's why the result has come down a little wet lubricants obviously though they do struggle once contamination is introduced because wet lubricants will absorb uh, contamination so that has shot up quite markedly to 33.7 percent right I've added in one little extra graph uh, which is the cumulative wear for blocks one through three so that's clean block one dry contamination block two and then clean block three so it's the three dry test blocks before we start to introduce uh, the wet contamination in block four so at the end of the first three thousand kilometers so hot wax x is actually it's still at zero percent so there's nowhere through the first three blocks which is rather uh, amazing although very closely followed really overall um, the median for the top commercial wax is at 2.3 percent Medium for the drip lubricant, um, sorry, wax drip lubricants at 9.7, and medium for wet lubricants at 76.9. So you may notice that that's an even bigger jump after uh, block two. 
and that's because they just don't clear out you know in general the contamination absorbed in uh, I guess throughout that uh, block two the the wear rate by the the end of that block two is obviously ramping up as you know it's had more additions of contamination so it has I guess the highest amount of contamination that it will have absorbed by the end of block two and if it's if they're not really clearing that out which they don't um, then that wear rate just continues to ramp up in block three even though you know contamination has stopped being added throughout that block so it just sort of highlights again the challenges that wet lubricants have if you're operating um, you're completely exposed to all sort of you know dust and dirt but yeah that's a pretty obviously you just simply we can't get a better result than zero percent for the first three thousand kilometers so so far things looking pretty amazing okay heading into block four into wet contamination so ah oh, sorry the legend's gone there somewhere uh hot wax x is the white uh bar here so that has jumped up to 23.1 percent so that is now uh basically around double what the average is for the top commercial waxes so similar to what we ran through when uh, we did the detail review for rex black diamond wax the high concentration mix so they're also using we'll say something in a similar category to hot wax x uh, which was also amazing through all the dry test blocks that had a jump uh, when water was introduced and we've seen a very similar um, thing occur with hot wax x so there is potentially something with additives in that kind of graphene graphite uh, category that may not be getting along with water it is something that is being investigated further by manufacturers involved um, so the pink bar there is the average of the top um, commercial waxes the orange is the average for the uh, drip lubricant or the median i should say for the wax drip lubricants and the blue is the median result for the wet lubricants all right having a look at the i guess what we class the main test overall so the cumulative wear through the first 5,000 kilometers of the test which is blocks one through five ah, sorry that should say hot wax x hot wax x so hot wax x has averaged uh, oh sorry return result of 28.2 percent average of the uh, top commercial wax is at 17.9 percent the uh, median for drip wax lubricants is 78 percent and wet lubricants we don't really need to worry about so obviously what's occurred there is the um that wet test block so there was obviously somewhere in block five um after the uh the wet contamination block four but that block four result really you know sort of pushed hot wax x's total cumulative wear at the end of the 5000 kilometer main test up higher than the average of the other top commercial waxes tested so obviously it was absolutely slaying it through the first three uh, dry test blocks but once water was introduced things comparatively went fairly downhill i mean it's not a terrible result when we compare it to obviously even in the sort of the top wax drip lubricant categories it's overall you know very very competitive but i guess against its peers in the top immersive wax category uh water was kind of its kryptonite uh, again that is just comparatively Alrighty, skipping across to single application longevity uh just basically dry uh, conditions no contamination being added uh hot wax x was very competitive so you'll notice i guess two of the longest lasting wet lubricants uh, ever tested are just pretty ridiculous with regards to their uh, treatment longevity immersive waxes um, have not sort of matched the absolute longest lasting um, wet lubricants with regards to treatment longevity but they have come you know I guess with a return to figure that's extremely impressive you're not going to need to worry at all with regards to the treatment longevity of a product like hot wax x or uh, rex black diamond wax uh, even if you look at uh, just your m speed wax and your silica hot melt you've got very impressive treatment longevity as it is Th this table's relatively skewed um, again just because i had introduced a new test protocol for single application longevity uh, the previous protocol was not uh, you know very good and i had to sort of scrap that 
and I just haven't been able to sort of rebuild that uh, data table up uh, too much yet. So most of what is on this data table is actually the, I guess, the better tested products. Um, and so it's sort of a, we've got some amazing products that are sort of looking like they're ranking fairly low, but they're actually, you know, putting in a perfectly excellent result with regards to their um, treatment longevity. But we can see here that Hot Wax X um, at basically over sort of a thousand kilometers of sort of normal dry road riding conditions it's a very long lasting wax treatment i can uh i guess give a match for that with my own field testing so i had tested that on my uh, main road bike um, which normally when i ride that it's with a sort of you know pretty good group so we're typically riding fairly hard a lot of climbing and it was just starting to sound a little bit on the sort of the dry side so wax treatments are generally pretty easy to pick up when the treatment's getting done it's a pretty obvious dry sound and feel that you get when the uh, the wax is too thin um, and yeah it, it really took to just over 1000 kilometers before it just started to give the hints of, of sort of sounding and feeling dry so that's a that was a good match for the, the test results here so it's really quite something with regards to its treatment longevity Right, we had a pretty much identical result in the dry contamination um, single, single application longevity test so it just didn't make any difference so nothing seemed to really get in at all uh, obviously the wet lubricants that were on top in the uh, no contamination uh, longevity test are not because once contamination is introduced that is not the friend of wet lubricants uh, with the wax you know the top waxes it can mostly just sort of bounce off in hot wax x's case yeah it's sort of the really the first one it just didn't seem to impact at all um, so we got pretty much the exact same result uh, despite constantly uh, applying a lot of um, dry sandy loam as to what it attained in the, uh, the, the test without putting uh, abrasive sandy loam onto it so pretty impressive stuff if you have a uh, very long either road event or dry off-road event um, yeah it is likely to see you through that entire event even if it is a stage race so really impressive stuff. Okay, last one, the single application longevity test in extreme conditions. So it's being hit with a lot of water and the, uh, the sandy loam. Uh, it was, you know, still okay. So, uh, you know, we saw in the main sort of test that it obviously had a, um, a bit of a jump with its wear rate once we hit wet contamination block four. And it may not look like it's uh, sort of had the same impact here, but it has, I mean, you just have to look at those rather astounding uh, results for the dry test blocks that, yeah, it's been a very big impact again with regards to its, uh, you know, what happens when water is introduced. But again, comparatively, it's in a pretty good ballpark. So, you know, it's not like you have to stress if you're using this product that if it if it's you get caught out uh, in the rain or in a wet event, you know it doesn't go to crap it is just not comparatively as amazing as it is in the you know the non-wet conditions it's still holding itself up overall in a very good spot right, normally with the um i guess the commercial waxes that we've tested there's not a huge amount to discuss with regards to test observations because they're, they're normally you can't tell too much difference between them. So, I mean, aside from the absolute black graphene wax, which was bad, um, the normally with an immersive wax chain, you know, it comes out of the pot, the wax pot when you re-wax it, which is a re-lube, basically looking brand new again. And they're not struggling to get through to the end of intervals. And unlike, say, wax drip lubricants, which some of them may start to gunk up over time, or wet lubricants that can become a, a real black mess, with the immersive waxing for the top waxes tested to date really they just look great from start to finish um, with hot wax x things were uh, i guess there were some notice well, i guess one main noticeable difference um, both on the test machines and also in field test uh, observations that we really can't sort of sugarcoat too much yeah and that is that the the wax had a really i mean it, it was frankly a brutal break-in period so normally with immersive waxing 
uh, when you hang the wax up to, uh, or the chain up, sorry, post wax to set, you know, the, the chain will set fairly uh, hard. You need to break the wax uh, bond on the links to reinstall the chain onto your bike. And typically, depending on a few things, so one, the wax, two, the temperature, things like that, the chain can be quite stiff for, say, five, ten minutes uh, when you first start pedaling. So, and you can feel some, you know, extra drag in the chain as the, basically, what you're doing is you're pressing the excess wax out of the chain and then polishing up that, the wax surface that's coating all of your chain parts. Once that wax coating has been properly broken in, and most times they will hit their really sort of optimal point if you're sort of doing a race at somewhere around about a 30 minutes of, uh, of riding mark. Uh, basically then all the, the wax coating or the parts of your chain will be sort of polished up to a nice sheen. And that's, uh, you know, a part of what makes the wax chains so fast is that all parts of the chain are sliding on a solid super slippery coating of wax. It basically has the lowest stiction. So because you've got so many links and basically parts of your chain link so there's there's literally there's eight separate um, chain parts that need to get moving from static to articulating or reticulating every single link um, articulation and you have if you're pedaling at sort of around 90 cadence uh, in the large chain ring it's around 40,000 articulations a minute um, as you're pedaling along so at eight separate pieces of uh, chain parts that need to get moving from static to uh, you know articulating you know it's that's you know pretty much around 320,000 separate pieces of sliding surface friction a minute so again even though the difference in say stiction between one lubricant and another might be quite small if you take take a very small number and multiply it out by 320,000, you get something you know tangible with regards to the, the, the difference in its efficiency. And it's the same with the viscous friction. You know, being a solid, uh, you know, lubricant, all those parts sliding on a solid, super slippery coating, um, you've basically you've got zero viscous friction more or less. So really, that's why the top immersive waxes are down to the sort of the super fast category as opposed to other products which might be brilliant you might have a brilliant wet lubricant but a wet lubricant is going to sort of struggle to match the immersive waxing simply because there will be some small amount higher stiction there will be some small amount of you know viscous friction things like that so long story short though you know there is always a break-in period with uh, you know the normal top immersive waxes like m speed wax and hot melt rex black diamond and that can vary a bit um really cold uh temperatures that breaking period might be an hour um normal temperatures it's going to be somewhere around the sort of the 20 to 30 minutes <clears throat> hot wax x takes that break in to a whole new level of fun okay so it was you know normally the wax break in whilst it might take say 30 minutes for m speed wax uh to hit its optimal zone in in most sort of you know normal temperatures after about five minutes you really don't notice it and that initial five minutes it's like yeah you can notice it's a little bit more draggy um than you know sort of when it's you're not going through that breaking period but it's not something that you are i guess too conscious of it's by the time you sort of warmed your legs up over that sort of first five minutes that that i guess the steep part of the initial breaking is is done the initial wax has been excess has been pressed out things are starting to polish up and so you get a you know a pretty sharp taper off with regards to uh, what impact you may feel for breaking that that wax treatment in that's really not so much the case with uh, with hot wax X so with hot wax X the I guess the extra drag that you have initially let's just say it is very noticeable um, and it does go on and on and on so you don't just get a steep drop off after five minutes or 10 minutes or i would say even sort of 30 minutes it, it is a you know honestly it's a brutal um initial break in for that wax treatment and that's me testing it through um you know very normal temperatures uh, if you were uh, trying to break hot wax x in in a very cold climate or cold season uh, where I'm saying it's probably you know allow at least an hour and that uh, initially at least sort of the first 30 minutes of that minimum are going to be quite brutal in cold um, seasons or cold temps it could 
could be quite a bit more than that. So, uh, yeah, if you're using hot wax X, just take note. Um, like, so after that, you know, it was a brilliant period. The next basically, I guess, 950 kilometers uh, were outstanding. But far out that first kind of 50 kilometers was, that was a drag. Um, and I did not look forward to the rewax and the process to go through that again. Um, in fact, if I was using that as my sort of daily wax, um, because I say really enjoyed the awesome silky smooth smoothness for the next 1,000 kilometers after the break-in, I would probably cheat and just use one of my uh, machines to just run that chain uh, for about 10 hours overnight, and then it'd be sweet. But you're not likely to have that option at home. Now, taking into account, I guess, as well, um, whilst I tend to only bring out my road bike when it is dry, if it's uh, wet, I'm pretty much always on the mountain bike or gravel bike. Um, not everyone, again, is, is doing that. Um, if you do ride any lubricant in the wet, uh, really, you should be resetting that post-wet ride. Same is going to be true for Hot Wax X. Um, same as any immersive wax, post-wet ride, it's great to do a re-wax to reset um, the contamination that the water will have brought in through the chain. So if you are using Hot Wax X and you're riding frequently in you know, wet conditions, um, again, I wouldn't be overly stressed about the, the wear rate result. Um, you know, if you are doing it a lot, should you be spending $280 for a smaller tin of a product that is, I guess, comparatively not testing as well as other wax options, such as, say, M Speed Wax or Silk is Hot Melt or Rex Black Diamonds 11 Plus 1 mix? For me personally, if I was riding a lot in wet conditions, then Hot Wax X you know, wouldn't be my choice because I'm paying a lot more money for a product that has, at the end of the day, still tested with higher wear in those conditions. Um, but just another point to consider with that though is that if you're doing what you should be doing and that is re-waxing post um, a wet conditions ride um, and that that's coming along relatively frequently you're going to be going through that frankly brutal break-in um, fairly often as opposed to at least if you're only riding in the dry get through that break-in um, you know period and then you're sweet for about a thousand kilometers so just you know factor that in uh, depending on yeah, what you typically ride in. Okay, so that um, fun aspect is obviously something I've had a good chat with uh, Josh about over time, um, and Josh is um, sort of keeping the loop. Uh, you know, he has obviously had the same feedback from uh, pro athletes and pro uh, race teams that they do a lot of work with, and you know, supply their sort of silk lubricants um, to use. And yeah, it's, I think it's been a bunch of fun uh, for those athletes and and teams as well. Um, there is a little sort of hint and tip, uh, which is to you, you know, put, I guess, a little bit of synergetic, uh, so the silk is synergetic into the wax. Um, just sort of, you can just basically add, say, like five mil, and that does, it does help. So it does soften up the wax a bit. Um, it wouldn't move it into a, I guess, a category where I'd say that, you know, it makes the break in fine. Um, I would say it makes the break in a little bit less brutal and for a little bit less time to uh, to get past the brutal stage. But also one thing to note with that, so Synergetic is a fairly industrial, um, you know, sort of smelling product. Silka doesn't add any scents uh, to their lubricant because if they, you know, their, their, their stance, and I can understand their, their sort of point on this, is that if they add 3% uh, scent uh, to the product, that's 3% less, you know, lubricant volume that they can add. They want their lubricant to be lubricant um, so yeah it is not a uh, I guess a nicely scented wax uh, once you add synergetic to it you will have a very industrial uh, scented wax uh, coming sort of from your pot so if you're doing that in an apartment just be aware of that as well Alrighty, let's give you a break from my silly face for a bit and have a quick look at the Costa Run modeling uh, based on the test results. So for Durace, um 11 speed components modeled across the results for uh, blocks one through five. So that includes the dry contamination block two and wet contamination block four. 
Um, so it's come out. It's yeah, despite the very high cost of the um, the wax itself, due to the overall still competitively low wear, um, it's come out in uh, seventh place overall. So still very good, um, but obviously it's sort of around double uh, the MSW new formula um, Silkers Hot Melt and the Rex Black Diamond 11 plus one blend. Ducking down to the modelling based on uh, the dry contamination block uh, two. So this one's a bit of fun. So, you know, in that block, it returned a 0% wear rate. However, obviously that would uh, extrapolate out to infinity. Um, I do need to, uh, I, I give them basically a theoretical maximum of 25,000 kilometers because even on the very best products, it's still in the real world going to be unlikely that uh, sort of most would get more than 25,000 kilometers from a chain. It has happened, but it's obviously not that common. Um, so we kind of use 25,000 as the max result if we get a 0% wear. Um, we can see that it's actually moved down despite the exceptional result and that is because the um, modeling here, we're basing that on the GRX810 components. Um, GRX uh, components, so the cassettes and chains and chain rings are not that expensive at all. So by far the dominant cost uh, in this modeling is the price of the hot wax x itself so that's what drops that down quite a bit uh, in this block despite the very low wear rate so as always um, you know in most times the the wear rate is what you should be looking for along with your component cost if your components don't cost that much then you have to i guess stress a bit less about the wear rates to a degree if your components are worth a lot then the wear rates become the dominant cost uh, in your cost to run, not the lubricant. Um, and that, that'll happen quite quickly once that price goes up. Um, going to the um, wet contamination um, uh, block, then again, it's gone you know, overall not bad. We've got a little bit of a mix of very high lubrication cost, um, a, you know, a, I guess a competitive wear rate, but not to the tune of the, the top tested products. So we can see that you know, your Rex Black Diamond, M MSW and Hot Melt are really dominating uh, with sort of around uh, one third of the wear rate, uh, sorry, one third of the cost to run versus uh, Hot Wax X. All right, so what's the wrap for this uh, very expensive um, immersive wax? Um, so yeah, from mine, uh, my perspective, I think that this may be an iterative product from uh, Silka. I, you know, we've seen that Silka have really invested and focused quite heavily in the, you know, the lubricant space and overall they have brought a number of really great products, um, you know, to the market and, you know, really they've got a number of products in the, the, the top 10 of the, the testing. So that's been, that's been great to see. I just think for the cost of Hot Wax X and the, the quirks with regards to the break-in and also with regards to uh, the wet weather performance, which again, sort of stressing, you know, it is not bad per se. However, for that cost and, you know, really if their aim is to have an all-singing, all-conquering, you know, number one immersive wax that you're going to be charging uh, around $280 for, I don't think that you know it not dominating in all aspects. It's just sort of hard, I think, to, to justify that particular price. So I I'm going to guess that there's going to you know potentially be an updated product at some point in the future, and that this particular one is a little bit of a stepping stone. Um, you know, Silka, you know, to their credit. You know they're very aware that it's not like they're denying um, any of the I guess the test results they're not denying the feedback that they're getting from uh, you know the pro teams and they're not going to be sitting idle uh, and just letting the status quo be the status quo with regards to where hot wax X is and just letting that be for you know the foreseeable future I think we're going to see an update of some type and there, there's going to be another iteration uh, of their you know I guess absolute premium immersive wax you know for your bicycle chain lubricant okay um, i didn't stock hot wax x so i wanted to really you know for that price put it through its uh paces um pretty much through the complete test before i made a decision on whether zero friction cycling would stock and recommend it 
um, you know, really based on those sort of couple of factors uh, that we've covered, I'm not comfortable to stock and sell um, a wax at that price without it being you know, really more towards the absolutely perfect all singing, all dancing uh, product. I was for uh, a block using that, um, I guess, if you ordered a race uh, prep through Zero Friction Cycling, Hot Wax X uh, was the wax being used for the full race prep. But again, um, you know, over time and thinking, I've sort of moved that back now to the, the venerable and very fast M Speed Wax with uh, race powder. It's just a bit more of, I guess, an overall sort of sure bet um, that it's going to be a very fast uh, product in all conditions. Um, there's not going to be any lingering doubts whether or not it's been broken in enough post the, uh, the break-in runs on the, the race prep machine. Um, and the only thing really that you're giving up was you know having a wax treatment that's going to last a thousand kilometers so um so i've moved back to the uh, m speed wax uh for the race chains and yes we i guess i won't be stocking our uh, hot wax x um really i guess it's i guess it sort of related to its most direct competitor i think in this space which would be uh, rex's black diamond wax and the reason i guess that, that Rex Black Diamond is it's sort of the best one to really directly compare it to is that it's um, you know believe that they are using a modifier uh, or friction modifier that's in the same kind of family as what uh, Hot Wax X is using and also if you're using the high concentration um, blend of the Rex Black Diamond um, it's it sort of works out to an you know similar ish price uh, if you were just using what's called the four plus one uh, high concentration blend for Rex Black Diamond. The, the cost of that wax, it's not as much as Hot Wax X, but it's you know it's it's up there. Um, so that's really, I guess, why I'm, I'm putting that as its most direct competitor. And those two compared, so there, the Rex Black Diamond's uh, performance in the dry blocks was still extremely low wear, like really almost within test variance. It was a kind of a similar jump to uh, Hot Wax X in the wet contamination block, but it was a bit lower. I think it was like 5% lower. I think Rex Black Diamond Wax was 18 point something and Hot Wax X was 23 something. Uh, it has really strong uh, long treatment longevity, especially in the dry. So, you know, really um, a cut above uh, the other immersive waxes apart from Hot Wax X. So it's kind of got a lot of all the great attributes that Hot Wax X has, um, but without that absolutely brutal breaking period. So that's that's one sort of key difference uh, that I think in real world applications is really really important because uh, yeah, it's unless you've used it, it is it all I guess hard to overstate that that <laughs> that first period, it's not a bunch of fun and and for a fair old while. So, you know, Rex has done a great job with regards to tuning their base uh, wax that, that they have for their uh, fancy modifier and very fancy wax. But it gives you a huge amount of those benefits um, without all the pain of that, uh, that break in. So, and that's part of why, you know, it does come at a bit of a cost premium over um, you know, MSW and, uh, and hot melt. So that's really sort of what we're, I guess, for that kind of similar price, if we're looking at, you know, the Rex Black Diamond high concentration mix versus Hot Wax X, that's, they're, they're really sort of the two that are in that ultra high expensive immersive wax category. And out of those two, I would, you know, definitely have to give the, the nod quite clearly to uh, Rex Black Diamond, simply because you're kind of getting all the benefits without the, the yeah, the painful uh, breaking period. And yeah, I do like the fact with the Rex product as well is that you can tune your um, wax blend. So the Rex Black Diamond Wax comes as basically 12 blocks. It comes with a friction modifier block, which has got all the goody stuff in it. And then you've got 11 base blocks. And so you can tune that mix and you can now buy these separate uh, friction modifier blocks. Uh, so that once you've used the one, if you, you're using a high concentration blend from your original pack and you've got a whole bunch of base blocks left over, you can now just buy the extra friction modifier block to use your uh, base blocks with. So they brought that out to market like they promised. So yeah, overall, uh, a few good points there that really uh, tip the, the things in favor of the Rex Black Diamond. 
and so that's why I stock the Rex Black Diamond, um, but not choosing to stock the Hot Wax X. And I will wait to see what Silk would do. Um, obviously, I, I don't know. I can't give uh, any sort of timeline guesses or anything like that. But I will not be surprised if we see um, a, I guess, a, a new iteration or change to their super premium uh, immersive wax. Um, I think they've attempted something great in Hot Wax X, but it's not perfect, and for that price, they will want it to be, their customers and proteins will want it to be, I think there'll be yeah, changes coming, updates coming, and that'll be exciting to see. All right, look at the time again. Okay, that will do. Thank you, everybody, if you uh, watched this. Hope you found that interesting and uh was useful if you were deciding whether or not to spend about 280 australian dollars on a little tin of wax um yeah have a great weekend of cycling and i'll look forward to catching you hopefully next friday all things going smoothly